All right, so once again, this is now chapter six. This is now the beginning of exam number three. And uh, what we're gonna do uh, in chapter six is we are gonna round out your ability to do a hypothesis test all on your own. This is now when we finally figure out how to do step two so that you can have the complete package and know how to, once again, intelligently, accurately, without bias, uh, systematically generalize from a sample that we have access to, to a population that we're hoping to help. So again, this is a very important determination to do. You, if you have an effective treatment and you don't generalize, then you are denying uh, benefits and help and uh, assistance to millions of people. If on the other hand, you have a treatment that is not effective and you do generalize, you will be harming millions of people. So we have to make sure to the best of our ability to make that correct decision. And we need to be able to do this hypothesis test all on our own. So then we're doing the cool stuff where we're looking at psychological data, figuring out does this treatment work, does this treatment not work. Uh, we can make that uh, assessment on our own. So today, uh, right now, is when we are going to round out your abilities in terms of hypothesis testing so that you will be ready uh, to do this all on your own. And uh, to do that, we need to fill in the last uh, skill, skill number two, uh, so that you then have the complete packet. So skill number two is what we're gonna get to right now. How do you determine that comparison distribution? How do you figure out what that comparison distribution is? So in order to do that, we are gonna go back once again to samples and populations. That is the basic fundamental uh, principle upon which all this hypothesis testing is built, the relationship between those two. And we're going to go back to our distribution of sample means and how to calculate and determine those characteristics of this distribution of sample means. So uh, again, that it will all come back to that central limit theorem, that little bit of mathematics that makes psychology possible. Okay, so in the hypothesis testing procedure, that five-step procedure, up until now, for step two, determining the characteristics of the comparison distribution, I've always said, you know, uh, we'll see how to do this in the next chapter, but for now it has to be given to you. There is your uh, comparison distribution characteristics. Now we're finally gonna figure out how do you, on your own, how can you get those two numbers right there? How can you figure out the mean of your comparison distribution and the standard deviation of that comparison distribution? And this all ties back into uh, samples and populations. So it all ties back into the fact that we use samples to estimate things about a population. This is what psychologists do. We test a certain group of people, that's our sample. We try to generalize to something about the entire population that we're trying to help. And usually you take the mean of your sample and you try to estimate the mean of your population. And as we saw before, if you have an unknown population, a population you know very little about, specifically you don't know the mean and you don't know the standard deviation, we don't know when we take a sample out of that population, is our sample coming from the middle of the population? In which case our sample mean will be very close to the population mean, it'll be a good estimate of that population mean. Or does our sample come from extreme positions in the population distribution? In which case, for example, here, our sample mean will vastly underestimate the population mean. Or if it comes from the opposite extreme, our sample mean can vastly overestimate the population mean. So we don't know which of those categories we're in. We, should, we don't know which of those three uh, circumstances we are in. All we know is that we have a sample and we're trying to estimate a population from that sample. But we saw that some of these samples are more likely to occur, such as that sample right there. Some of these samples are much less likely to occur, such as that weird sample right there. And if you take every single possible sample out of a population and measure its mean, you can get a distribution of sample means uh, that consists of, once again, the mean of every single sample 
of a particular size taken out of a particular population. And that's your comparison distribution because we have a sample mean from our experiment and it is unfair to compare the scores of a group of people to scores of individuals. You cannot compare your sample mean to your population distribution. You gotta compare your sample mean to a distribution of sample means, hence the distribution of sample means. And as we saw, just to remind you, your distribution of sample means is not the same as your population distribution. So the only time your distribution of sample means is the same as your population distribution is when your sample size is a sample size of one. Because then your distribution of sample means is a distribution of individuals. It's a distribution of samples of a size one. It's an individual. And that's the only time your distribution of sample means looks like your population distribution. For any other situation, sample sizes of two, your population distribution, excuse me, your population distribution will not look like your distribution of sample means. Your distribution of sample means will be different. And that distribution of sample means changes the bigger your sample gets. So the higher your sample goes, the more people in your sample, the more scores in your sample, your distribution of sample means changes. Thankfully for us, it changes in a very predictable way. It changes in a very understandable way. But the major point that I am trying to hit over and over again, because it is the key error that students do when they're doing hypothesis testing, is not using your comparison distribution, you use your population distribution instead. That's an error. So make sure when you're comparing a sample mean, you're comparing it to a distribution of sample means, your comparison distribution. All right, so typically we only have one sample that we uh, take in a study, so we can't build a distribution of sample means by testing sample after sample after sample after sample. So how is it that we get to this number here? How is it that we find the mean and we find the standard deviation? Well, it has to do with the central limit theorem. It has to do with this bit of, like I said before, mathematic that has been proven and uh, links a population to its distribution of sample means. And what it says is that for any population that has a mean and has a standard deviation, aka every population, right? Every population has a mean, every population has a standard deviation. For any population that has a mean and a standard deviation, you can calculate the distribution of sample means for a particular sample size and it will have a mean that is the same as your population mean. And it will have a standard deviation that is the standard deviation of your population mean divided by the square root of the size of your sample. And that is the key to getting these two pieces of information here. The mean is the same as your population mean. Your standard deviation is the same. As, oh, sorry, your standard deviation is your population standard deviation divided by the square root of the size of your sample. And then the last piece of information from the central limit theorem is that the shape of this comparison distribution, the shape of your distribution of sample means, will approach a normal distribution as the size of your sample increases. So the bigger your sample, the more normal your distribution is, the more accurate it is to go to that table in the back and look up those uh, values. <coughs> All right, so just one more time. Population distribution is only the same as your distribution of sample means when your sample size is one. That never happens in psychology. You never stop at a sample size of one. If you're doing a case study, you would, but that's an entirely different uh, realm of statistics. For uh, typical psychology studies, you have more than one subject. You have 10, 20, 30 subjects. And once you go to more than one subject, two subjects, three subjects, your distribution of sample means is different than your population distribution. 
So keep that dichotomy in mind. You have a population distribution, and you have a very different distribution of sample means as soon as your sample size goes above one. So that's the distribution of sample means for a sample size of two from this population, sample size of three, sample size of four, sample size of five, you can see getting much like a normal distribution. And that happens for any population. And that's why we don't need to know what does a population typically look like. As long as we're taking a sample, we know that the distribution of sample means is going to have a normal distribution. So that's the part down here, that the distribution of sample means, your comparison distribution, will approach a normal distribution as your sample size approaches infinity. So we know it's going to be normal. So now, how do we find those two numbers right there? Well, we do that again through that central limit theorem. So I'm going to break this down the way that your textbook breaks it down, just so that you have kind of parallel information there. Um, so rule number one, the mean of your distribution of sample means is the same as the mean of that population of individuals. So that one's pretty straightforward. The mean of your distribution of sample means is the same as your population mean. All right, so the mean of your distribution of sample means is the same as your population mean. So if our population of individuals has a mean of 40, our distribution of sample means also has a mean of 40. That's just, a, that's just because your sample will typically be a good estimator of your population mean. That's the way that it works out. So again, this is the easy one, the straightforward one. Your distribution of sample means will have the same mean as your population. The big one though, the one to know, the one to pay particular attention to, is for the variance and the standard deviation of your distribution of sample means. That does not equal your population variance. So the variance of the distribution of sample means, we'll start off with variance because your book started off with variance. The variance of the distribution of sample means equals your population variance divided by the size of your sample. All right, there it is in the correct so this is what your textbook has. There it is in the correct uh, terms. The standard deviation, sorry, the variance, the spread of your distribution of sample means is equal to the variance of your population divided by the size of your sample. That is why you cannot use just the variance of your population. It's the wrong variance. You have to divide that by the size of your sample. More importantly for us, however, is rule 2b, because in order to calculate z-scores, we need to use standard deviations. So that basically says that your standard deviation of your distribution of sample means is equal to the standard deviation of your population divided by the size, square root of the size of your sample. And that's how you get this number right down here. So for example, if you have So for example, let's go all the way over here. If you have a population that has a mean of has a mean of 100 and you have a population that has a standard deviation of let's go 15. All right? So your typical IQ score distribution in your population and you are taking samples out of this population of a sample of nine. So your sample size is nine individuals. If you need to determine the comparison distribution for this, the mean of your comparison distribution will be the mean of your population distribution. So the mean of it would be 100. The standard deviation of your comparison distribution, that's where you need to do a calculation. That's where you need to have a very clear differentiation between this is your population, this is your comparison distribution. Because the formula for it is your standard deviation for your population divided by the square root of the size of your sample. So in this case, it would change from a population standard deviation of 15 to a comparison distribution 
standard deviation of five. All right, so make sure that when you're doing your, your homework and in exam number three, you're not confusing your population distribution with your comparison distribution and make sure you're using that formula to get the standard deviation, the spread for your comparison distribution. All right, so that's the key move right there. And then just to uh, round it out, oh, we'll round it out in just a second, just to kind of show you how important this standard deviation is, just so that you can get a, a foreshadowing of how crucial this number right here is. Not only does it get its own term, it gets its own name. This is known as the standard error. This is reported over and over again and used over and over again, so much so that it gets its own name. So not only does it get a term, it actually gets its own name. That's just let you know how important it is going to be for hypothesis testing. All right, and then let's round out this uh, very um, brief look at chapter six. Uh, rule number three, the shape of your uh, distribution of sample means, the shape of your comparison distribution is going to approach a normal distribution. And there's two conditions for this, either or of these needs to be satisfied. The one that's most often used, if your sample size is 30 or more. So once you go above, and that's a bit of overkill, but that's the kind of cutoffs, uh, you know, line in the sand that your textbook uses for this uh, amount. As soon as you get to 30 subjects, it doesn't matter what your population looks like, your distribution of sample means is going to look normal. And that's a very powerful tool because that's what allows us to do psychology. We don't need to know what the population mean or population distribution looks like in order to know that what we're working with, the comparison distribution, is normally distributed. The other thing that might make the comparison distribution normally distributed is if you're starting with a population that is normally distributed. And this is usually lesser known, right? So it's known for IQ scores, for example. That is normally distributed in a population. So whatever your sample size is, you're gonna have a normal distribution. And that's just the kind of two final criteria for that central limit theorem. All right, any questions on that? That is the key of what I wanted to cover in uh, chapter six. Uh, so just one more time to kind of um, uh, put this into your minds. Uh, make sure that you know the distinction. Whenever you see the word distribution, you should be aware that we are now dealing with three different distributions that are very, um, uh, very uh, um, distinct, and you need to keep them distinct. Number one is the population distribution. That is a distribution of individuals. That is all the individuals that you are interested in. Number two is your sample distribution. Those are the individuals that you have access to. Those are the individuals that are part of your experiment or part of your treatment. And you can have a number of different samples taken from the same population. Those samples all have means. And if you take all of those means and put them into a distribution, you get a distribution of sample means. And that is what we were calculating today. The mean of your distribution of sample means same as your population distribution. You can see it lines up. The standard deviation of your comparison distribution, this distribution of sample means, standard deviation of your population divided by the square root of the size of your sample. So make sure that you are doing this calculation, all right, whenever you don't have your comparison distribution. Again, in exam two, I will give you the comparison distribution. I don't expect you to calculate it, but well, moving forward, when you are asked to calculate it, make sure that you're not just grabbing the first standard deviation that you see, that's your population standard deviation, make sure you're using that comparison distribution standard deviation. All right, so uh, that is uh, what I wanted to cover for chapter six. Any questions on calculating that final step two, calculating your uh, characteristics of your comparison distribution? All right, so just a few things to, uh, to mention. Uh, if you uh, didn't complete your chapter six pretest or if you didn't uh, do well on it, once again, 
As always, my stat lab study plan open, get those mastery points, you can get 100% on your pretest. And then uh, we do have uh, a homework assignment for chapter six, but it is gonna be due well after the exam, so it is not due, just so that everybody's clear on this, it's not due on Wednesday. Spend the time between now and uh, Wednesday's uh, meeting to prepare for exam number two. So get your exam two, your chapter four and chapter five homework done. Get your chapter four and chapter five post tests done. Earn your chapter four and chapter five uh, study plan points. But just be aware, because we won't announce this during the exam, uh, you are now ready to do homework assignment nine for chapter six. That is due uh, midnight before we meet a week from today. So when we come back on June 10th, uh, that will be the day that uh, that homework assignment is due. So just be aware of that, put it in your calendar. Definitely not due uh, before the exam, due after the exam, because this is all exam number three. All right, so that was our brief look at uh, chapter six. So what we should, uh, what we're doing right now is we are going to continue on. Again, we got this accelerated uh, pace for our summer session. But um, once again, we are now going to move on to our introduction to uh, chapter eight. And um, this is not going to be on exam number two. This is exam number three stuff as well. So make sure we're all clear on that. All right, chapter eight. So we have up until now um, started our look at hypothesis testing with very unique situations. Specifically, we have uh, done this where we have known what the population parameters are. So up until now, we have always been able to say, oh, in the population of individuals, this is their level of self-esteem. Or in the population of individuals, this is how, you know, this is their average IQ scores. We've always been able to say that. That is a very rare occurrence. That is very doesn't ever, it doesn't really ever happen in the real world. In the real world, you're usually dealing with unknowns about your population. So that's what we're gonna start right now. Real world uh, situations that you will encounter as a psychologist or reading about psychology. Now we're gonna start it off with our introduction to chapter eight. We're gonna start it off with single sample experiments to introduce this idea of this hypothesis test. All right, so in this time, uh, so now we have all five of these uh, steps down. We got all five of them. You can do all five of these steps on your own. So you are ready uh, to do this in that particular example where we know the population. Unfortunately, that is not going to occur uh, very often. However, now we're going to switch gears. So not only are you ready to do hypothesis testing, but you are also ready to do this for real. So you're ready to do it alone and you're ready to do it for real. So in a real world, real life uh, scenario. So once again, this is the actual, right now we're gonna start with the actual, no caveats, no assumptions, uh, real world uh, skills that psychologists use to test their, um, uh, uh, to test their theories, to test their treatments, uh, to discover things about the mind and behavior. All right, so for this, we're gonna revisit, we're gonna introduce this by revisiting uh, our previous example of Harlow and his uh, monkeys. And if you can recall, uh, if you, you, might have, you might not have noticed this, but when we first did this, Somehow, we magically knew how many hours monkeys uh, like to spend with the terry cloth mother. Somehow we knew that it was a mean of 90 and had a certain standard deviation. That number was just picked out of the air. That number we couldn't have possibly known. That was a very unrealistic situation. Now we're gonna take a look at how would we do this test if we actually just had the data that Harlow was working with and we made no assumptions about how the population might be. All right, so we are going to introduce uh, the idea of the T-test. We're gonna give you a little bit of foreshadowing about what is coming up 
And then we're going to review hypothesis testing, review this idea of the t-test, and uh, sorry, of hypothesis testing. We're going to introduce the t-statistic. It's the alternative to the z-statistic. It is very similar. It's kind of blink and you'll miss it, what's different here. But it's going to uh, replace our z-statistic. And then uh, if we have time, uh, we'll take a look at hypothesis tests with that uh, z-statistic. All right, so foreshadowing the future. We are, uh, up until now, have been doing hypothesis tests with, um, we've been doing hypothesis tests with Excel. And up until now, we've been able to handle that uh, pretty well. That is because we've made a lot of assumptions about what is involved in these hypothesis tests. And what that does is it makes the mathematics much, much easier. It makes it able for us to do it very straightforwardly and very efficiently using Excel. We are now getting into the real world situations, the real world hypothesis tests, and these can get very complicated. So not today, but next time we meet, the first time after the exam, we are going to abandon using just Excel for hypothesis tests, and we're going to introduce a specialized program uh, called SPSS, which is a statistics program. It is made to run statistical tests. So we are going to give SPSS, this robot, this machine, we're going to give it all the heavy lifting. We're going to have it do all of the difficult calculations because they tend to get multi-step from here on out. And then our job as uh, statisticians, as psychologists, there's going to be two things. Number one is going to be to make sure that we identify which hypothesis test needs to be done so that we can tell the program, hey, do this particular test. And we format the data in a way that the program can understand it. So SBSS has a particular way that it wants its data submitted or inputted. We need to make sure that our data matches that input. And then after we choose the correct uh, hypothesis test, SBSS will run that hypothesis test immediately. And then our uh, final responsibility is to take the numbers, the output that SBSS has given us, and interpret it correctly. So SBSS, this program, will not interpret your uh, output for you. It'll give you all the numbers that you need, but it will not tell you whether you should accept or reject your null hypothesis. That's still on us. But thankfully, a lot of the calculations that we do, we can now give to uh, SPSS. All right, so what have we seen by way of review previously on our hypothesis test? All right, so previously, we were dealing with a very artificial situation where we have had a known population. We know the mean of the population. We know the standard deviation of the population. That almost never happens. But that was the way that we were introducing hypothesis testing to make it a little bit easier. And from this known population, we were able to determine our distribution of sample means, our comparison distribution. Right? We were able to determine the mean of this distribution because it's the mean of our population. And we knew what the mean of our population was. Right? So we could do that. We figured out the standard deviation of this comparison distribution. It's the standard deviation of our population divided by the square root of the size of our sample. Right? This little number down here, standard deviation of our comparison distribution. And we could do that because we knew the standard deviation of our population. And then what we did is we took a look at our treated sample and we said we have a mean for our treated sample. What's the probability that the mean of our sample came from our, uh, our comparison distribution. And we drew our lines in the sand. We calculated out a z-statistic for our sample mean. And if that z-statistic was placed our mean in the body of our distribution, then we would accept the null hypothesis. We would say that our treatment did nothing. Our sample still belongs to this comparison distribution, which is based on the untreated population. But if our treated sample went into the tails, we would reject the null hypothesis. We would say our treatment is effective, our treatment has changed this sample into a new uh, population. It now belongs to a new population. 
So that was the basic idea. Uh, that is the basic idea behind hypothesis testing. Notice that that comparison distribution can be calculated because we know the mean of the uh, sample, sorry, the mean of the population. We know the standard deviation of the population. And because we can calculate these exactly, we were able to look up the z-scores, right? We were able to look up the cutoff uh, z-scores, those critical values. We were able to calculate a z-score for our sample as well because we knew the mean and the standard deviation of the population. That almost never occurs in the real world. One thing that does occur in the real world is this situation right here where you have an unknown population with an unknown standard deviation but a hypothesized mean. And I'll give you, uh, I'll explain that in just a moment. So you have a hypothesis in terms of what you think the mean should be, but you don't know how spread out your population is. This is one typical example that occurs in psychology research. Because we don't have the standard deviation anymore for our population, because we're missing that piece of information, there's certain things that we cannot calculate. There's certain things that we need to change. So before we go much further, Let's talk about this hypothesized mean. The hypothesized mean, this is the mean that should occur if there is no effect, if there's no treatment effect, if there is no difference. In some situations, we might not know what the actual difference is, but we definitely know what the number should be if there's no difference. Okay, and one classic example of this that is, um, you know, hotly debated issue right now is the gender pay gap. So there is tons of research that is being done just to try to figure out what the gender pay gap actually is. So you'll hear, hear estimates all the way down to um, women are earning 49 cents on the dollar for, uh, every, uh, you know, for what males make, all the way up to women earn 98% uh, on the dollar for what males make. People are trying to figure out what is the actual gender pay gap in, uh, you know, in the world. However, if there was no gender pay gap, if there was no effect of gender in terms of how you pay, then we know exactly what the situation should be. It'll be this situation right here. So we might not know how much women actually make for every dollar that males make in their population. But we do know that if there was no difference between the amount of money paid to women and the amount of money paid to men, then women would make one dollar for every dollar that males make. So this situation might not exist, but if there's no difference, in other words, if the null hypothesis is true, and there is no gender difference, there is no gender gap, then we know that women should make one dollar for every dollar that males make. So that is one situation where you can hypothesize what your population mean should be. In this hypothetical population where there is no effect of gender, everybody's going to make the same amount of money. Um, if uh, you are given uh, uh, if you have eight hours to study two topics and there's no preference between how long you're going to study for those two topics, you're going to spend four hours on one, you're going to spend four hours on another. So sometimes we can hypothesize what will the mean of the population be if there's no difference. And that's your null hypothesis. Your hypothesized mean for this unknown population is your null hypothesis you then do the uh, hypothesis test to see if that null hypothesis population is actually the true population. All right, so importantly, we have this hypothesized mean, but we don't know what the spread is. We don't know how variable this, uh, uh, this population is. So because of that, 
we're missing key information for our comparison distribution. We don't have that standard deviation anymore. It's gone. So because of that, we can't calculate a z-score. A z-score is gone. So we can't use that anymore. So because we can't calculate our z-score, we don't give up. We don't just say, oh, well, hypothesis testing was nice. Well, we had it. We say, all right, we can't use the z-score. What else can we use? Is there an alternative to the z-score? And there is an alternative to the z-score, and it's called the t-statistic, or the t-score. So the t-statistic is your alternative to your z-statistic, and this is for your unknown populations. So from here on out, we're going to be using the t-statistic in hypothesis testing, because from here on out, we're going to deal with a very real situation where we do not know what the population is. We don't know what the spread of the population is in this case. So for the unknown population in this situation, we have a hypothesized mean, a mean where, we're, uh, where we say if there's no difference, if there's no effect, this should be the mean. This should be the mean amount. But we have an unknown spread. We have no idea how variable our population actually is. So we can't directly calculate our comparison distribution because we're missing those pieces of information. So what can we do? How can we rectify this? How can we uh, fix this that we're missing uh, these pieces of information? Specifically that piece right there. How is it or what is it that we can do to fix that particular situation? Well, what we can do so we can fix it so that we can actually um, do our hypothesis testing is we are going to use the t-statistic instead of the z-statistic. Now one of the great things about this shift right here is that there's very little change to the five-step procedure. The five steps that we've been using still remain. Those five steps do not change. It's still step one, two, three, four, five, null hypothesis, comparison, distribution, cutoff scores, your samples, score, and then make your decision. That stays the same but we are going to tweak it a little bit. So what stays the same and what changes? Uh, state your research question, sorry, state the question as a um, research hypothesis and a null hypothesis about the population. That stays exactly the same. So no change is going to be made to step one. So everything you learned about step one, keep doing it, keep doing it exactly the same. Step one has not changed. Step two, determine the characteristics of the comparison distribution. Well, this does change. All right, so this is going to be the major change. This is going to be the big one. We're changing our comparison distribution. Uh, step three, determine the cutoff sample score uh, uh, on the comparison distribution. Your lines in the sand. This will also change. The change here is going to be very slight. Basically, instead of flipping to Appendix A1, you are now going to flip to Appendix A2. So it's just a new table of values, but it does change. Step three does change. Step four, determine your sample score on the comparison distribution. This is going to change so slightly. This is your blinking, you miss it change. Uh, it's, it's basically the same. Technically, it changes. And then finally, step five, decide whether to reject or accept the null hypothesis. Uh, this does not change. The logic is exactly the same. No change needs to be made whatsoever for this particular step. So what I'm going to do right now is we're going to introduce kind of these changes just so you kind of get a peek behind the curtain and then uh, we'll uh, end up with probably like 15 minutes of practice time towards the end of the, uh, end of the class. Um, but I do want to introduce this idea so that you have it on your mind so that we're ready to go uh, for a week, um, the week that we come back after the exam. All right, so what are we doing in step two? Determining the characteristics of the comparison distribution. That does change. So remember, we're missing the population standard deviation. We no longer have that. But what we do have is we got this sample right here, right? We do have a sample from the population. So we might not have the exact standard deviation from the population, but well, we got a sample from that population, so we can use the sample's standard deviation to estimate the population standard deviation. 
And that's the key move. We're going to use uh, our sample to estimate those unknown parameters of our population. So we can calculate our sample variability to estimate our population variability. We can calculate our sample standard deviation to estimate our population standard deviation. So variance, this is, again, remember the, uh, uh, your standard deviation squared. There's your population variance. That was a formula for your population variance. Uh, this is your formula for population standard deviation. So we have, uh, that was when we could calculate out the population, standard deviation, population variance. We can't do that, but we can calculate sample variance. So there's the formula for sample variance, sum of squared deviations divided by the size of your sample minus one. This is also known, this size of your sample minus one, remember I tell you minus one, told you minus one occurs in our universe over and over and over again. That minus one, size of your sample minus one, that's called degrees of freedom. Uh, it's basically the idea that for any number of observations, you have a limit on how many observations can be whatever it is that they want to be. So just to really quickly explain this, I'm going to use my barbecue example. So let's say that you go to a barbecue and it's you and four friends and you get there and there is one serving left of five different dishes. All right, so you go to the barbecue and there is one hamburger left. All right, and there is one hot dog left. And there is one last slice of pizza. And there is one last, what do we got, one, two, three, there's one last steak. And then we have one last serving of bland potato salad. All right, so you got five people, right? You and four friends show up and there's one serving left. How many of you have freedom of choice in this particular situation? There's five of you, a sample of five. How many of you have freedom of choice? Well, the first person does. The first person can walk up there and say, you know what? I love me some hamburger, so I'm going to take this one. That's going to be for me. So, subject number one has uh, freedom of choice. They have a degree of freedom. They can choose what they want. Four people left, four choices left. Next person has a choice. They might say, it's a little unorthodox, but I'm going to take that pizza. All right, so now we've had two choices. We're down to three subjects. Next person goes up. They have a choice. They're going to choose steak. All right, so now three people have choos chosen. We got two people left, right? So three people have had a choice. We got two people left. Next person, they still have a choice. They'll come up here and they'll say, you know what? I like hot dogs. I'm going to choose that. Now you got one person left over. They got no choice. They have to end up with the potato salad. So we've had five people in our sample. Only four of them have had a choice. Only four of them had degrees of freedom, and that's where that degree of freedom comes from. It's that idea that out of a sample, only four people will have choice. That last person kind of gets locked in to their, um, to their decision. So that's where that N minus one comes from, and it's called degrees of freedom. That DF is degrees of freedom. Sample standard deviation, there's your formula for sample standard deviation, just the square root of sample variance. So what we do here, because we don't have access to the population standard deviation, is we just estimate that unknown standard deviation using the sample standard deviation. So this can give us our calculation of our standard error. This can give us our calculation of our comparison distributions variance. Because instead of the original, where we had a known standard deviation from the population divided by the uh, square root of the size of your sample. We are now doing the estimated standard error, and that's the difference. Estimated standard error is the standard deviation of your sample. You are just calculating the standard deviation of your sample, and that is taking the place 
of the standard deviation of your population. That's it. That's the only big difference here. That's your move right there. So pretty straightforward. We don't know the population, so we do what we always do. We take a look at the sample and we estimate that population parameter. However, this move here for step number two has consequences and that comes out in step number three. So in step number three, when we have to determine the cutoff sample score, when we have to find this number here, because we're putting 5% in the tail, for example, uh, that also changes. So because we changed how we calculate the comparison distribution, what occurs is the shape of the comparison distribution actually changed. It's no longer a z-score shape. It's no longer the normal distribution bell curve. It is now a t-score, a t-statistic distribution. So by way of comparison, there's your z distribution, there's your typical bell curve, your normal distribution, and a t distribution, because it's based on, because it's spread, is based on the estimated standard deviation for the population, what that means is sometimes your estimate's going to go higher, sometimes your estimate's going to go lower, right? You're going to have more variability in your estimates. Because of that, a t-distribution spread is always going to be spread a little bit wider. T-distributions have more in the tail than a z-distribution does. This difference right here is why we cannot go to the z-distribution table anymore. We cannot go to Appendix A1 anymore. Once you get into the real world, Appendix A1 cannot be used for hypothesis testing. We're going to need to go to Appendix, I believe it's A2, your t-statistic, by uh, distribution. So that's the first major difference between the Z distribution and the T distribution. T distribution's got a different shape. It's got more uh, volume in the tails, right? It's got, more, uh, it's got more in the tails. The other thing about a T distribution is that its shape changes the larger your sample goes. So for a sample size of two, there's your T distribution. One degree of freedom, remember sample size of two means you got one degree of freedom. So this is where a sample size of two, that's what your t-distribution looks like. Sample size of three, sample size of three, two degrees of freedom, right? That's what it looks like. Sample size of four, sample size of five. Importantly, it changes as your samples get bigger and bigger. Sample size of six, this is a t-distribution for a sample of 11, so we have 10 degrees of freedom. Here it is for a sample size of 21, so we got 20 degrees of freedom. And notice that as your sample sizes increase, your t-distribution looks more and more like a normal distribution. And this is to be expected because the bigger your sample, the more accurate it's going to be at estimating your population. So when we get to a big enough sample, we get very close in our comparison distribution to the original Z distribution because our sample statistic got very close to our population parameter. Our sample standard deviation is almost guaranteed to be very close to our population standard deviation. So importantly though, it's different. Even though it's just a little different, it still is different. So that's the alternative that we're going to be using. Uh, and that alternative means that we have a new table of values. We have a new distribution table, not the Z distribution, we now have a T distribution table, and that is the, um, the change there. We're going to have to flip to a new table. And then we got uh, one last change, we'll cover this and then we'll uh, call it a day. Uh, step four. Slight change, very slight change, but definitely we need to note it, we need to be explicit here. For your t-statistic, there's a formula for your t-statistic. There it is, and hopefully you will realize that it looks almost exactly like the formula for a z-score. There's your t-statistic formula, there's your good old z-statistic, z-score formula. They are almost exactly the same. The only difference is, well, there's no difference 
in the numerator there. So I just so this is just to reflect the way that your textbook writes it here. Sometimes they'll write it with the square root of the variance. But importantly, there's no difference in the numerator. You're still taking your sample mean and subtracting from it your comparison distributions uh, mean. The difference occurs in the denominator. And again, this is why we cannot use that, t, uh, that z distribution anymore. It's this difference. This is why we can't use the z distribution. We got to use the t distribution. And in, uh, in reality, again, I said it was a slight change. What you're doing is instead of using your population-based comparison distribution, standard deviation, you are now using your sample-based comparison distribution, standard deviation, but it's the same idea. You are still using the standard deviation of your comparison distribution. All right, so uh, I think that is uh, enough of an introduction to uh, the real-world hypothesis testing that we're going to be doing after the exam. So uh, we'll end, uh, end it right here. we got about 10 minutes left. If you have any final questions uh, about uh, your exam uh, and the stuff that's going to be on your exam, please let me know in these last 10 minutes. If you want to head out early, uh, feel free. And remember, next class, 9 a.m., we're going to have the open review session. So work on your homework, work on your practice Excel sheets, and whatever questions you have in order to get ready for the exam, show up at 9. I'll be here to answer any of those questions. Student driven, so bring those questions. Optional, if you want to uh, spend some time studying in another matter, if you just want to catch another hour of sleep, feel free. 10 a.m. is when we're going to start the exam. It's going to be in class. You have to complete it in class. And uh, other than that, uh, I'm done for today. <laughs>